get to Ephesians 5 in a little bit. If you want to turn over to Romans chapter 7, and that's where we will uh, start. Romans chapter 7. We'll be there in just a moment. Um, I don't know if any of you heard a strong amen after the opening prayer. Uh, that was my son Wyatt, and uh, we've been out of town uh, the last couple of days. Wyatt's been with grandparents, and Wyatt is really excited to be back with mom and dad, and like we are wrestling him this morning during worship. So I'm just glad he was he was in the prayer and ready for uh, to say amen when the prayer was done. Uh, I think we need more of that. I think we need some excitement, uh, not for when prayers are over necessarily, uh, but we need some excitement when it comes to our, our worship and and uh, in, in our prayers and in all aspects of our worship. So uh, maybe maybe why to setting the pace a little bit. Um, the reason we were out of town, we were uh, with the youth group in uh, Huntsville uh, for a youth conference called Exposure, uh, Exposure Youth Camp. And Exposure Youth Camp is a camp where over 3,000 people gather together in the Von Braun Center in Huntsville uh, for a week of worship and praise. And uh, it was just a, such a wonderful time. I included, I, I wanted to try to get just a little bit of a picture to people of, of what this event looks like. So this is a video that, uh, that they made um, that shows just what day three was like of exposure. And we've got uh, a picture in the, in the top right of what the worship area looks like. And then the bottom right is a picture of our group. And I'm sure they loved this is a rookie mistake. I, I was a youth minister for 10 years. I know better. Uh, but we took our picture on the, the last morning right before we left. So they had stayed up super late the night before and had just woken up when we took our picture. So I'm sure they love that that's the picture I chose to display for them um, to, to show the congregation. But I, I wanted to show you this because, well, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, because our youth group is important. The things that our youth group does is important. And, uh, and I want you to know our youth group is doing things, uh, whether it be weeks like this where they, where they go off places or just their Bible classes or the service projects that, that, that they do. Our youth group is active in doing things. Uh, another reason I wanted to show it is because, uh, I, like I said, I was a youth minister for over, over 10 years. And Exposure Youth Camp, a, a camp that's just right down the road for, uh, for three days, um, is, to me, one of the best youth events out there, uh, by far. It is one of the best. I, I went to all sorts of, of conferences and weekend trips and retreats and all these things, but Exposure, to me, is, is, is top of, of these kind of events. And if, you've, if you're a, a, a youth group age person and you've never been, I really want to encourage you to come to Exposure. Or if you're a parent of someone... Uh, who is uh, youth group age. We really want to encourage our, our parents to come and help chaperone this in the future. It really is. It's a wonderful event. Uh, the singing there is, is incredible. Um, that's one, one of the highlights for me always. Um, and uh, so I just wanted to, to say that. And, and the reason we were at Exposure was because uh, our youth minister, Michael Deese, Michael and April, they had their baby. Um, so we are so uh, excited for them, and I'm sure they're, they're uh, home, work, home watching probably. So uh, Michael and April, we are so excited for, for you and baby Eleanor, and uh, we can't wait to meet her from an appropriate distance whenever that time uh, comes. Now, while I was at Exposure, um, this year I had uh, a new responsibility, and I was uh, one of the ones in charge of our college group at Exposure, and, and, and Exposure is mostly a high school group, a uh, high school trip, uh, but they've, they, they, they do things for the college age, and we're expanding that. Um, but uh, we, we had about 200, 200 to 250 college students that we were working with, and uh, we, we did a Q&A for our college students, and we just put a QR code on the screen, and they could submit any question that they wanted, and we could maybe give some insight into uh, whatever kind of questions that they had. And we got all kinds of questions, you know, the typical like, really interesting and controversial questions, and we got some questions that were deeply personal like this one. Uh, one college student said, how can I stay faithful to God when I am my own worst enemy? Now, I know uh, a lot of times when I get up here to speak, I like to pose a question to you uh, to get your mind going, and it's a theoretical question. It's a, it's a question mostly just there to, uh, to pique some interest of yours. And this is not what that question is. This is a real question from a real person who was really feeling this exact thought to the point to where they thought, I need some outside advice and some help. So when I see this question, how can I stay faithful to God when I am my own worst enemy? It's not something that is theoretical. This is something that someone was really going through. 
Now, I know most of us in this room are Christians, and, and most of us in this room have been Christians for some time, and you know uh, that this thought is not unique. All Christians, all of us go through something like this, a thought like this, at one time or another. And, and, and maybe some of us go through this kind of thinking quite often. How can I stay faithful to God when I am my own worst enemy? When we, when we look at ourselves and we say, I have all these failings in my life. I have this desire to be sinful. Uh, I, I want to follow God, but at the same time, I have this desire to be sinful, and I have all these failings, and those things keep me from being faithful to God. What am, what am I, what am I going to do? How, how can I be faithful to God when I keep getting in my own way? So as, as, as we look at this question, and, and this is, um, we'll get to the text that, we use to answer this question, but as we do, I wanted to, to just first preface this with us encouraging you to remember uh, that this uh, is a real person who asked this question, um, and, uh, and I don't know how you feel when you see a question like this, but when I see a question like this that was asked by a real person, um, my heart goes out to them, right? And probably yours, yours does too, because when you see a question like this from a real person, you understand the person who asked this question is going through something right now. The person who asked this question maybe is hurting. The person who asked this question is maybe dealing with guilt and with shame. Um, and, and the person who asked this question really needs help. And I know there are people in these pews this morning who, are, who have for sure asked questions like this before. And there might be people who are asking questions like this even this morning. So we're going to take a few minutes. Uh, I'm going I'm to show you what we use to answer this question, and, uh, which is in Romans chapter 7. And uh, in Romans chapter 7, we have Paul having a conversation with the church in Rome, and he is um, talking to them about the law of Moses and the deficiencies in the law of Moses and the perfection of the law of Christ and the Spirit of Christ. And within that conversation, in that context, Paul gives us insight into the struggle that all humans have, into the struggle that all humans have. And, um, and, and when I answered this person with, with this scripture in Romans chapter 7, I did so uh, for the purpose of showing that this is a struggle. First, first off, before we really answer the question, this is a struggle that all Christians have. All, all people who follow God at some point or another recognize, I right now am my own worst enemy. Here's how Paul phrased it. This is Romans chapter 7. We're going to read verses 14 and 15. It says this, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I... This is Paul writing. But I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. Paul is acknowledging, I am my own worst enemy. I'm my own worst enemy. Uh, I, I know that the law is spiritual. I know that God is spiritual. I know that I need to appeal to uh, this spiritual God and to be pure towards him. Uh, but at the same time, I am flesh. I am human. I am under this bondage of sin. And he says in verse 15, For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Paul is saying something very similar to what the person who posed the question in our college group said. Right now, I'm, I'm my own worst enemy. Um, I, I should say, I don't want to, uh, we, we could do a, there's a lot of sermons that can be preached in Romans 6, 7, and 8 and how those three chapters really go together. And Paul here is addressing something specific about the law of Moses, but from that we can extract these ideas about our uh, relationship between the flesh and the spirit. So the first thing I wanted this person to know when we were answering this question was, look what Paul said. Paul, this person who is, has this incredible relationship with God, acknowledges that um, at, at times his flesh gets the best of him, and at times he is his own worst enemy. Uh, I, as I was preparing for this lesson, I stumbled upon this quote by C.S. Lewis, who said this, No man knows how bad he is till he has tried very hard to be good. No man knows how bad he is until he has tried very hard to be good. And, uh, and I wish I, I had that quote on hand when I was answering this person's question, but, you know, we were answering in the moment, so I didn't have it. Uh, but the fact that the person who asked this question is aware of his sinfulness, or his or her sinfulness, or, or is aware of their own shortcomings, actually shows that they are aware of God's righteousness, which is actually a great starting place for your relationship with God, is to be aware 
of God's righteousness and his goodness. And it's in his righteousness and his goodness that we become aware of our own shortcomings, of our own failures, of our own flesh, which is often leading us to sin, which is what Paul is talking about here. So I think first and foremost, the way I want to answer this question, for anybody that's struggling with this now and how I want to answer it for the person um, in, in our college group then, is to take some comfort in knowing that while the struggles are diverse, all of us have the same struggle of sin. While the struggles are diverse, all of us feel at different times that we are own, our own worst enemy and, uh, and we are in need of help. There's comfort in that. And, uh, and, and as we continue to go through what Paul says, we start to see Paul's wisdom in how to conquer this battle that is between spirit and flesh. He goes on to say this, down in verse 21. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God, in my inner being. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Paul continues on to, to say, he even uses, uh, I, I highlighted it there, it's a, it's a waging war between his spirit and his flesh, or his desire to, uh, to be spiritual, and his, desire, his human desire uh, to fall short of that spiritual desire. And he, and, he, and he sees that in his life, that it is a war that is raging uh, within him. And as this war is, is raging on, look at how Paul, what he says about himself. Verse 24. Wretched man that I am. Wretched man that I am. And I think that is, um, you, could, you could use that, that term wretched for, for two ways in, in, in what Paul is feeling in these moments. Wretched in the fact that, man, it, it is awful that I am a sinful person. It, it is awful that I have the desire to do right, and yet I have uh, evilness that is welling up inside of me. I am wretched because I am, I am just covered in, in uh, sin and, and failing to falling to these temptations. But I also think Paul is saying, wretched man that I am, as in helpless. Wretched man that I am, as in I am in despair. Wretched man that I am, as in, as in I need a lot of help. When I see him say, wretched man that I am, I think about the person who asked this question. How can I stay faithful to God when I am my own worst enemy? I think that is the point that when this person asked this question, I think that's the point they were at. They were at Paul's point. Wretched man that I am. Sinful, falling short of, of God's standard, wretched, but also wretched of, of miserable, of I want to do better, I want to be better. Wretched of, of I need help. And Paul, of course, goes on. Remember what he says, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Paul doesn't just say, Wretched man that I am, wretched people that you are, good luck, right? Paul says, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And he goes on, and this is his, his answer. Of course, you know the answer. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. There is therefore uh, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Paul offers us hope. Paul speaks to the hope that he currently has in this life. Most people believe that when Paul writes this passage, Paul is speaking reflectively. Of, of where he was before he met Christ and where he, and in, and in these, these last couple of verses, where he now is in light of uh, his relationship with Christ. But it is encouraging. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. Uh, so then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So the big question is, is are you in Christ Jesus? Are you in Christ Jesus? And it's really simple. If you are in Christ Jesus, congratulations, there is no condemnation for you. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that, isn't that that's such great news? It doesn't say uh, anything about perfection there. That is something we strive for, but it's not something we all obtain, right? Uh, it, it doesn't say anything up there about... Um, 
any of the Mosaic law and the rituals that you would have to do, anything, anything like that. It just simply says, for those that are in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation. For those that are in Christ Jesus. And basically, all, all that means is, if you are in Christ Jesus, it means that God sees Christ when he sees you. And God cannot condemn his own son who lived perfectly. His perfectness, his sonness is now imprinted unto all the people who are in him. It's a beautiful, wonderful thing. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free. There is a bondage, there is a weight that comes from sin, but with Jesus Christ and the spirit that comes through Jesus Christ, there is freedom from that bondage and there is freedom from that weight of sin. And what, before we go to our next uh, couple passages, I, I think what Paul is setting up here is the transformation that comes for Christians, the transformation that comes for Christians, the transformation that comes for, uh, for our hearts and our souls and our minds um, that, that totally transform us from people who are so focused on the flesh to people who are focused on the Spirit. And, and over and over and over again, when we see Paul's writing, and we're going to see some more of his writings, we see Paul contrasting these two ideas of flesh and Spirit, of how we are people who are flesh. We are people who have human desire, we are people who have human failure, and we are going to be people who sin, but we are also people who appeal to the Spirit, who have the Spirit, and who are uh, encouraged by the Spirit. Okay, so Paul is setting up this idea of, of flesh and Spirit, and it's the flesh that brings us down, but we need to be focused on the Spirit. And in fact, he goes on in Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17, to say this. But I say... Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Really simple. Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Uh, it, 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 and really, I, I, I guess when we're answering this question about um, how can I stay faithful to God when I am my own worst enemy, you can look at uh, your, 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 your own worst enemy because of your flesh. And the way that you stay faithful is by focusing less on flesh and more on, on spirit, of course. That's what Paul is saying. But I say, walk by the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit. Let that be your way of life is by the Spirit. Um, it's similar to be in the world but not of the world. Right? You are in the world. You are in your flesh. You are in your, your human body. But you are not of your human body. You are not of your flesh. You are of the Spirit if you're a Christian. You're in your human body. Uh, but the way that you choose to live your life is by the Spirit of God. All right, but I say walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. When it comes to us being able to remain faithful to God, we have to acknowledge that the flesh is the enemy. That the flesh, our humanness, uh, which has been uh, corrupted by the evilness of this world, uh, that, that is the enemy. That is the thing that brings us and pulls us away from God. So we have to be focused on the Spirit. Um, probably just a couple pages over in Ephesians chapter 5, uh, which is what... Uh, Jim read for us, Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 18. Uh, Paul, again, is talking about the Spirit, and he says this, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Uh, now, Ephesians chapter 5, verses uh, eight, uh, really verse nine, 18 and 19, um, a lot of times we like to pull these two verses out and speak about certain things, but it's really great for us to remember what Paul is speaking about in verses 18 all the way through 21. And he is speaking about the Spirit. So when Paul says here, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Uh, Paul is condemning drunkenness. Okay, Paul is condemning drunkenness, but that is not the reason he is writing this text. All right. he, he, he is uh, telling people not to get drunk, but that is not the reason that he is writing this text. He is writing this text to remind people of how they should view and treat the Spirit. He is contrasting drunkenness with being filled with the Spirit. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but there's a contrast here. But be filled with the Spirit. 
And um, some people will preach this uh, verse, and they'll say, you shouldn't be drunk with wine, but you should be drunk with the Spirit. And I'm not bold enough to say that. Uh, that that's not what, what Paul is saying here. He is contrasting these two things. But he is talking about us being filled with the Spirit and how the Spirit, like someone who is drunk on alcohol, will affect you. If someone is drunk on alcohol, that alcohol will affect them. If someone is filled with the Spirit, the Spirit that is inside of them will affect them in two very different ways, or in several very different ways. Uh, just briefly, right? Uh, wine, or, or, or drink, is a depressant. And uh, when, when you are intoxicated, uh, your uh, judgment will be impaired. When you are intoxicated, you will not be as, as wise as you are if you are sober. If you are in, intoxicated, you're, uh, you're going to be less decisive probably than you are, or maybe not less decisive, you'll just be less wise when it comes to the decisions that you're making than you are if you are sober. Um, pretty much all of your... Uh, faculties will be impaired in a negative way, whereas in the opposite direction, being filled with the Spirit is not a depressant where things are suppressed. Being filled with the Spirit is a stimulant where you become heightened. If you are someone who is filled with the Spirit, you are someone who is able to make wiser decisions than you are on your own. If you are someone who is filled with the Spirit, you are able to see things in a way that you are unable to see things without the Spirit of God living inside of you. The alcohol is, is a depressant, but the Spirit of God, when you are filled with it, it is a stimulant that stimulates you to be more than you can be on your own. The Spirit of God is a stimulant, is a stimulant that stimulates you able to not be your own worst enemy. The question that was posed in the college group, how can I stay faithful to God when I am my own worst enemy? The Spirit of God helps you overcome uh, your, your worst nature when God's Spirit is, is filled inside of you. All right, so, so Paul continues on. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Um, when I read this passage, but be filled with the Spirit, and it's a connected idea. Be filled with the Spirit. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. When you are filled with the Spirit, out of an outpouring of God's Spirit inside of you, you gather together with God's people. You address one another in spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. When you are filled with God's Spirit, you can't help but give thanks, as verse 20 says, always. When you're filled with God's Spirit, you, you see everything as a blessing in your life, and you, and you give thanks for that to God the Father. And when you're filled with the Spirit, when we're, you're together with, with God's people, you're able to submit to one another no one in the world who doesn't have the Spirit of God likes to submit to other people. But God's Spirit, who is holy and capable of making you to do things that you wouldn't normally be able to do on your own, makes it to where you not only can, but you want to submit to one another. And you can reverse engineer it a little bit. Um, when you think about the question, how can I stay faithful to God when I am my own worst enemy, you might acknowledge I am not appealing to my spiritual nature. The reason I'm my own worst enemy is I'm not appealing to my spiritual nature. And you can reverse engineer this where you say, you know what, I might not be appealing to my spiritual nature, uh, but as uh, my wife Savannah likes to say sometimes, sometimes you have to fake it until you make it. Sometimes you have to fake it until you make it. And sometimes you have to acknowledge, I am not someone who is currently appealing to my spiritual nature, who is currently truly being transformed by the Spirit of God. Until then, I'm going to fake it until I make it, and I'm going to submit to my brothers and sisters in Christ. And until 
God continues to fully transform me, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start giving thanks for everything. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to encourage my brothers and sisters in Christ by singing songs with them. And I'm going to, in turn, be encouraged by my brothers and sisters in Christ by, by singing songs and praising God. It is from an outpouring, it is from an overflow of, of the love of Christ and the spirit that we have that we are capable of doing these things, but also if you recognize, I have a need, fake it till you make it. Do some of these things, and I promise you, if you keep doing these things over and over again, you'll be surprised at how evident you see the spirit of God actually is in your life and how evident it becomes that God is taking over my life to where I'm no longer my own worst enemy, but instead, I, instead of an enemy, I have the greatest friend in Jesus Christ. I have the greatest friend in God's Spirit. That's why God's Spirit is called the Comforter. That's why God's Spirit is called the Counselor, because when it's in your life, it comforts you and it counsels you like a friend, like a wise and knowledgeable and trustable uh, friend. So, uh, don't get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. <clears throat> I was answering this question in the, in the heat of the moment uh, when, we, when we did this at the, at the college group, and uh, I summarized it by, by telling this person who was in the crowd, I didn't know who they were, um, how can I stay faithful to God when I am my own worst enemy? Um, it, it, I think I summarized it in uh, feed the Spirit, because it's the Spirit of God that makes you able to be over, overcome your own worstness. I, I think I summarized it as, as feed the Spirit, and you feed the Spirit, and you feed the Spirit by being with your church family. Um, and that's one of the ways you feed the Spirit. There's other ways you can feed the Spirit, but I think it's totally essential. Uh, your spirit is fed. The spirit of God inside you is fed. The spirit of God inside you is acknowledged when we are together with our, our church family. Um, and, and, and that's what a lot of what this passage is about, is being with your church family, uh, pouring out praise to God, giving thanks to God, and submitting to your church family as, as well. Um, I want to leave you with these verses we've already looked at. The reality of of living the life of a human is Romans chapter 7, verse 24. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And uh, some of you might be asking that question this morning. You might recognize there is a spiritual side of this life that I have not addressed. There is a spiritual side of this life. There is a spiritual uh, uh, nature to my own life that I have never addressed. And I recognize that I am wretched. And because of my sinful wretchedness, I recognize that I, my life is not what it could be, that my life is pitiful, that I have a constant war going on in my life. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this death? And thankfully, we have Romans chapter 8, verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus. Um, we talk a lot in the United States of America about freedom, and uh, we wear it as a badge of honor that we are a free nation, and we are, and we should be proud of our freedom, and we should celebrate our freedom, but it is nothing in, compar it is nothing in comparison to the freedom that we have in Christ Jesus. The freedom that we have, the freedom that we get to experience in Christ Jesus is far superior than any freedom that can ever be experienced uh, through anything worldly on this earth. Uh, Christ has offered you freedom from your own wretchedness, from your own sinfulness. He is ready to set you free, to transform you, to end the war that is raging inside of you. Uh, That's why we sing a song of invitation. It's an invitation, and really, it's, it's a song of opportunity. It's an opportunity for you just to think, am I free? Have, have I trusted in the freedom of, of Jesus Christ? Have I let the freedom of Jesus Christ fully transform me from sin and death to life and resurrection and being united in spirit with God? Have, have I let that freedom in Christ transform me? And I, and I hope that you have. Maybe you've never encountered what it means to be in Christ 
Jesus. Romans chapter 6, right before what we've read uh, this morning, Romans chapter 6 says, uh, Do you not know that all of us who are in Christ were baptized into Christ? Uh, if you've never been united, if you've never been found in Jesus Christ, that opportunity is here for you this morning. Maybe you, maybe you see, you know what, I, I, I believe in Jesus Christ, and I want to change my life and, and, and start living my life for him. If so, uh, we would be honored uh, to baptize you in the waters of baptism for the remission of your sin. Or maybe you've done that, and, and you, you've lived in rebellion of Christ. You've turned back to your wretched nature and your carnal nature and your sinful nature, and, and you, you've, you've put on the chains again. That come with living life in this world and you've forgotten about the freedom of Christ do not forget that freedom in Christ is offered to you and if there's anything that the church can do uh, to help you in your walk with God won't you come as we stand and as we sing